I think I think I would start by explaining to them uh, what kind of a society I grew up in. Uh, like uh, I would tell them uh, what I would consider the story of Monroe. Uh, the fact that when I was uh, when I was in elementary school and high school. Uh, the situation was that we had different communities. We had a black community and a white community. And uh, I lived on one side of town, and uh, white people lived on the other side of town. I would tell them at that time that uh, most of my activities were with, the vast majority of my activities were with my, in my black community. I had a black minister, I had black uh, schoolmates, and my my affiliation and my association with whites was just very limited. And the, the association that I had with whites was that my parents were very protective, and they taught us, they tried to teach us to protect ourselves, because they were in constant fear that we would run afoul of the law or the white community and get killed. And they didn't really mean, they weren't really worried about you like, committing crime. No, no, no. What, what kind of boundaries were they afraid you would cross? Uh, I was always to say yes ma'am, no ma'am to white people because at, at any time they may get angry and maybe slap me because I was being uh, sassy so I was told we were in a society where there were rules for white people and rules for black people and rules and black people had to stay in their place and our parents tried to teach us a place to stay in to keep us from running into trouble with white people when we would go into stores uh, in the downtown area uh, passing through the stores. We were always told, don't ever have your hands in your pockets. Or when you go in the store, make sure you are going in there to buy something and have your money in your hand. And uh, even if they, even if uh, they would, some of the um, uh, people in the stores would uh, uh say that you did something or give you the wrong change, we were not to argue with them because we could get ourselves into trouble and, and they didn't want us to get into trouble. So uh, we were taught basically just stay away from white folks because that's trouble for you. Just stay away from them, you know. And so um, I would walk to school past, uh, past the white school. The white school was about four blocks from my house. And I would walk uh, all the way across town to the black school, and I would pass another elementary school on the way that I just p walked right past. Is that a white elementary school? A white elementary school. But it never occurred to me to go there because I knew that that was a white school and that I was not supposed to be there. Uh, in our schools, we had uh, books. Most of the books that we had in our schools had the names of white children in them because what they would do in uh, North Carolina, in Monroe, was when they would get new books for the white school, they would give us the old books. From uh, And so, you know, you had to write your name in a book when you got it so that you, you were responsible for that book for the rest of the year. So, uh, mo very seldom did we ever get uh, a brand new book. We got used books all the time that were had already been used by the white school. All our teachers were black, and they too tried to encourage us to stay in our places so that we didn't get in trouble with the white people, uh, both going and coming to school, and and uh, so we we abided by that because those were the rules that we were accustomed to. But um, then not all black folks felt like that. I found out later. Yeah, Some right. like uh, we had a place and we had to stay in that place. 
some black folks, like my husband's family, I l- later learned, were kind of ra- uh, radical, and they they didn't think that we were inferior at all. Well, I don't suppose my parents thought that we were inferior, but they were not about to assert themselves in any way that will make white folks think that they felt they were equal either. But um, there were other people who said, oh, well, you know, yeah, we're uh, just as good as anybody. And uh, they didn't, I, I suppose they didn't teach the kids on the, the other kids, like my husband's family, they didn't teach them that you must uh, be subservient. They never taught them to be subservient. And my my parents taught me to be subservient uh, to white folks. But when I met Robert, I found out that not all black folks were subser- had that attitude of being subservient to white folks. And that was a struggle for me to um, recognize that uh, I had that my so-called place was not uh, just a colored place. It was that I should have, I had as much right to have a place in the world as any other human being. And it was not easy for me to overcome the training that my parents had put into me, you know, and and the society that uh, had uh, produced the kind of attitude that I had. Uh, eventually I did overcome that but uh, and I'm happy I did uh, but it was a hard struggle along the way to do that it was something that was based on, on experience too I mean, yes what, what, uh, what happened to people that stepped out of their place in Monroe when you were a girl what, what, was, what were your mom and daddy afraid of and I don't mean as a child I don't mean moving past the, the 8, 19, 11, 12 year old age, yes but what happens to uh... Oh, well, uh, there had been lots of incidents that you could, you know, I'd hear the older people talking about, uh, uh, especially with the boys. The boys were really uh, pressed on not to look at, even look at white girls because of the, uh, I heard about lynchings and things like that. I didn't hear of any specific lynchings in Monroe, but... Uh, just sassing, what they call sassing white folks. And I had uh, uncles and aunts who had had run-ins with the police in Monroe. Uh, and because they had sassed police that uh, they, uh, one of my aunts, I think one time, uh, got slapped when she was standing in the line at, uh, to go into the movie. She got slapped by a policeman uh, because she had sassed him, you know. So those kinds of things uh, um, that our parents taught us to be. And my father always kept uh, his pearl handle pistol under his pillow. And we shot that pistol once a year at New Year's. And he'd even let us shoot it at New Year's. And it was my task to make up his bed. And I I never, I, I would wonder why the pistol, you know. But he said uh, there was always this danger that people would come into our home, come after you. That the white folks were going to come in there for some reason that they have found uh, to get you. And so... Uh, that pistol was there for the protection of our home. So, so your father had a line, too. I mean, yeah. He wasn't completely... That's right. He wasn't... Um, I mean, it may not have been out there where robbers were. Right, was, right. But he had a, a line in the sand. That's right. Too. Was, yeah. He was my stepfather, and he worked at... Um, he worked on the railroad. And... Uh, he was definitely a person who was going to protect his home, but he always tried to teach us to not run afoul of any white folks if we could help it. And I don't know what the history of, of um, his 
family had been. Um, they came out of Catawba, South Carolina, down in that area. And, um, yeah, and uh, so, um, but anyway, he always, he, he believed, my parents both believed in education and they wanted us to get a good education and they always wanted us to get a good education so that we could get a job, good job, so that we wouldn't have to depend on uh, white folks for a living. My mother was a domestic. She worked for uh, the Belt family. The Belt. the Belt family. In fact, my name, Mabel, came from one of the Belt girls. <laughs> yes. So, um, looking looking back on that, I remember she was she was a, a domestic even before she worked for the De Belt family. But my real father was a chauffeur for the Belt family, and that's how that's how the name came about when uh, he was serving as a chauffeur for them. Um, you're, uh, you haven't forgiven. You, you haven't really. You haven't forgiven White Monroe for the way they were when you were. Uh, I, I'm still working on trying to forgive Monroe for what they did for uh, to to my family and and uh, to black people in general. And I don't think White Monroe has come to terms with what they did for two black people and what they did, you know, to us as individuals, but what they have done to black people over the years. I don't think they have come to terms with that. And Would you talk, mind talking about that a little bit? Aside from your, your family, maybe let's yes. what happens in, in 61 and... Yeah. Mm -hmm. But just to the, say that to the to the people you grew up with, the, the, that what that society did to to black family, black children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where do you start? Yeah. Where do you start? Um. Following uh, the the thing that in our community we had a tight knit community, and our I was perfectly happy to be with my people, and that's why I can understand uh, from some standpoint you are a product of your own upbringing, and I could under I didn't have any desire to be integrated into. A, another society because I was perfectly happy with my black ministers, my black teachers, my black friends, and I was satisfied there. And I didn't know or didn't feel the um, hurt of the limitations that we were on. I could see that my mother was working for pittance you know, and there are lots of things that we didn't have, for one but of the families in the right, right. Yeah. But we were. Uh, she made our home life so pleasant, so wonderful, that I, 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 I wasn't able to see how the the hurt that she was feeling, except that I could hear it in her voice, and I could hear it 
when they were discussing, when the adults would be discussing what was going on or what had happened. Uh, let me tell you an incident. She was working for, um, before she worked for the Belt family, she was working for a family. Uh, I remember the name. It was, uh, his name was Tina Stevens. And he worked for the hardware company. And I heard my mother relate a story that happened that while she was on the job. She was telling my daddy what happened that day. And she said, you know, today uh, Mr. Stevens had some of his grandkids visiting. And I was serving dinner. And one of the grandkids looked at me and looked at a little dog that Mr. Stevens had. And... Uh, said to Mr. Stevens while looking at me, Uncle Tyner, is Nippy's name really Nippy Nigger? It was a little black dog. And uh, my mother said, I couldn't help but speak up. And I said, no, his name is not Nippy Nigger, it's Nippy Stevens. And said the little boy got upset and said, Uncle Tiny, is it really Nicky Stevens? And she said that Mr. Stevens said to him, Yes, it is. Now shut up and eat your dinner. But she said uh, it made her know that he was teaching that child hatred of black people and had, when she was not there, they called the dog Nippy Nigger rather than nippy, you know. And um, so those kinds of things made me know that there was hurt. She was being hurt from the society, the way it was, she, it was going. Well, I, I, had been, my, I had a younger brother who died with tuberculosis at the age of, uh, he was six. Um, no, he was nine and I was six and while my mother was working for the Stevens I had been diagnosed as having anemia being anemic and so we had to have milk every day well the milkman did not come to the black community and so my mother would have milk delivered to the Stevens house and she would bring it home and on occasion uh, on the weekends I would have to go walk to the Stevens house to pick up the milk and bring it back home, you know. So those kinds of things, I, the, the society was just so structured that it was, uh, it was just racist to the core, and there were hurtful things that were happening uh, all the time. And I could hear my father and, and uh, some of his friends discussing racial incidents but not necessarily all that was going on but they were talking about how they would be insulted and how uh, white men on the railroad would uh, talk about black women in front of them and things like that and um, that they there was a lot of things that they just had to swallow in order to keep their jobs. And then they would really be proud when somebody would stand up, even if they would have to go to jail or get beaten up. They would be proud of the fact, well, at least he, you know, he resisted what was going on. But um, I don't think that the white society, uh, they didn't look on us as human beings. They just did not feel that we were people who had to be considered. We were just servants and um, kind of nuisance people in the community, I guess. But um, going through high school and elementary school, I had teachers who were very dedicated black teachers. And um, there was one man who was a um, member of our church. He was, he was a professor, uh, had, been, had a little college started. It was named, his name was Baxter Perry. 
And Mr. Perry was, uh, he was uh, very much a, I guess you would call him a Booker T. Washington type. He wanted, he wanted us to, he encouraged all of the young black people to uh, excel in, in education, and he believed in education, and uh, uh, he tried to instill in, uh, in us uh, pride in being who we were as black people and the fact that we had a history and... Uh, uh, to try to get away from the slave mentality that had uh, we had a heritage from the slavery, and uh, once uh, once a year we got to study Black History, you know, once a year Negro History Week at school, and uh, we would learn about uh, Booker T. Washington and people like that, but. But Baxter Perry would tell us about people uh, like Nat Turner. <laughs> and Nat Turner, right. And, and those people, Frederick Douglass and uh, Sojourner Truth and people like that. But uh, it was done in a way, he was always, the white people call him that crazy Baxter Perry. And uh, some of the black people, too, were afraid to associate with Baxter Perry because he was, uh, he was teaching us about the rebels within our race who would not accept being less than a human being in the society. And he, he was a teacher at the school? Or no, he was not. He had, I, I don't remember when, I remember he had a bus that uh, he used to pick up people to take to our Sunday school classes at uh, the Elizabeth Baptist Church. I remember people saying that he had, a, had taught at a college and tried to start a little college in Monroe. So I don't know. I, that's so when, he, when he was doing these things, was it part of Sunday school or was it? Yeah, he would, he would do that as a part of Sunday school. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, uh, it would be interesting to go back and see what Baxter Perry, what other, you know, see about where his college was and all that. That just happened to come to mind as we were talking. Um, but then, I guess from that, looking at my early childhood from that point of view, and then getting married to Robert Williams and coming into his family, being united with his family. Uh, when Robert and I first got married, I, was, I got a job working at the Ellen Fitzgerald Hospital. The black or nose? It was a hospital where black people were in the basement, admitted to the basement of the hospital. And white people were on the upper level. I learned a lot there. I learned a lot about this society there. Because I worked there in different capacities. I worked there as a nurse's aide. And I worked there as a maid. And I worked there as a cook. And... I learned a lot about the hurtfulness of the segregation system at that time. In the basement of Ellen Fitzgerald Hospital, the floors were cement. The plumbing that took care of the hospital was exposed over the patient rooms and, and the babies were placed in a utility room where, when f newborn babies were placed in a utility room where we had to empty the bedpans and wash them out and sterilize the needles. And I can see it this day. They had a couple of bassinets they would put in there in the utility room. Um, Well, this is, it, it, it 
said this was just part of the general second class racist society. It, 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 even, even then, you were. I was accepting to it because I was very grateful to have a job at that time. However, I began to see the differences that I had not seen before because as a maid, I had to go on all floors of the hospital for cleaning. Got it. And when I went on the, I don't remember if it was the second or the third floor, and I went into the, no, I, did, I wasn't allowed into the nursery itself, but there was a nursery there with nurses working inside the nursery with mask on and the babies were put in the nursery and then taken out of the nursery by a nurse and taken to the mothers when they were, you know, after the babies were born. While on the basement floor, the babies were taken away from the mothers by nurses or nurses' aides. They even allowed us to do that. And they were taken into the utility room where we washed out the bed pans and emptied the bed pans into the utility room. And as a maid, I began to see that. And that was just horrible. I remember... Yeah, yeah. I remember... Yeah, we're, we're talking about little children who are being exposed to germs uh, that could be life-threatening. The needles that were being, we put in uh, this autoclave or whatever it was called to sterilize, we'd take them in there after the nurses or doctors had used them. We'd take them into this utility room to sterilize them. Well, that's where the babies were. The bedpans with the waste matter we take into that utility room, and that's where our black babies were in that utility room. So that became one of the most hurtful things that Especially I encountered. And, and at that, you had a baby at that time? No, I was expecting a baby. Oh. I was expecting a child. Yes, yes. My children were born at home, thank God, with black doctors. Um, at the time, if I remember correctly, they I don't know if they didn't allow black doctors in the hospital or that the black doctor, we only had one black doctor at the time, and that was Dr. Kreft, or that he just didn't go in the hospital. Before that hospital was abandoned, he did go there, and Dr. Perry did go there. Dr. Perry, who became one of our uh, civil rights fighters, did go in that basement and uh, did work with those patients in that hospital. But they never, uh, they, that, that society never did change that, the position of black people in that hospital. When that hospital was, as far as I know, when that hospital was, uh, when I left that hospital, it was still that way. Black people could only be in the basement. And one of the black, sur one of the white surgeons down there, Dr. Falk, most of our people thought that he was, oh, he was the greatest thing since God. He was a good doctor. Everybody said he was a great doctor, a great surgeon. But I remember hearing some white nurses talking one day, and they said that Dr. Falk had said that he'd just soon work on a dog as work on a nigger. And that was hurtful. That was very hurtful. And the white doctors who maintained offices in Monroe had separate waiting rooms, of course, for black people. And when uh, we went to, had to have a doctor, if we didn't go to a black doctor we, and went to a white doctor, we had to go in separate waiting rooms. 
and they would wait till they had waited on all their white customers before they would patients before they would wait on us. So that was another way of see, seeing that, that something's wrong here, you know. And I that began to. It was just so hurtful to see what was happening to our people. Um, they allowed nurses, aides, and maids in the, in the Ellen Fitzgerald Hospital waiting on the black people there to do uh, injections and all kinds of things that uh, when I was on the white floor, only I found only licensed nurses could do. But... Uh, it didn't matter downstairs. And to this day, I, th I feel that that was a form of genocide. I feel that that was a form of genocide that they were actually using to curb our population or to, because they just didn't care. They just didn't care. And uh, I'm not so sure that that mentality is not still there because I still don't get the feeling that they're caring about what happens to us anymore. It's a very deep thing. Yes, and it's very hurtful. One of the reasons that I feel such, not, not a hatred, a dislike for Monroe, as as a place but I know it's not just Monroe as a place I realize that intellectually but coming back to Monroe and reliving some of those incidents and, and knowing what happened and passing places that yes that you mean something that to me mm -hmm. Other people just look at it and, you know, pass by and maybe think no more about it. Uh, I remember the incident when my mother was working for the Belt family. And she had been working for the family. I guess she had been working for the family, I don't know how many years, but... There was one daughter in the family, and uh, her name was Sarah. And um, I used to love to go to the Belt home, and uh, Sarah would give me toys, and she'd go in. She had doll houses with all this little miniature furniture in it and stuff, you know. And she would go in, and um, everybody called me Little Miss Mabel, including her, Little Miss Mabel, you know. And she would uh, go in her dollhouse and give me stuff, little chairs and little miniature stuff. And sometimes her mother would come in and say, "Well, now you've given Miss Mabel enough. Now you just—that's enough. Don't you know? Don't give her any more. That's fine." <laughs> so, um, but Sarah became—I guess when Sarah turned thirteen or tw twelve or thirteen, I remember my mother coming home from work one day and she said. Uh, well, said uh, Miss Mabel today gave told me told me off. I said told we said told you off how you know what? She said she told me that now that uh, Sarah has become thirteen years old, I have to call her Miss Sarah. And she said, and I wanted to say to her, is she gonna call me? Mrs. Barber, that was my mother's married name. But my mother was crying that day, and that was that was something that that hurt my heart. And I remember another time she came home from work, and she said uh, that Miss Mabel had gone out of town, but she had me to go shopping and buy, I forget how many pounds of bacon, and told me, now, Emma, you feed the dog every day. And the dog was to have bacon and eggs every day for breakfast, which they, that's what they fed him anyway. 
and uh, indicated to her, not outright, but almost accusing her or letting her know that she was not to take the bacon home to us, but she was to feed the dog the bacon and the eggs. And that's what she bought it for, and that's what she wanted her to do. And I remember my mother telling that and um, feeling hurt that she would think that she would take the bacon and the eggs home, even though we didn't have bacon and eggs every day for breakfast, you know. So <clears throat> even though they, they were good to us in a way that, well, one, they gave my mother a job. Uh, her father had bought my mother and father a house to live in when my real father was alive. And every year she would buy uh, an outfit for me for school, to go to school. And those were some of the positive things that they did for us. But my father worked for her for, I think I was talking to Gwen today about um, a living wage he worked for her for a wage. I don't know if it was a living wage or not. He could not. If he had had a living wage, he would have been able to provide those things for his family himself. And my mother, the same thing. If she had had a living wage when she was working for them, she wouldn't have had to depend on them to give us uh, secondhand clothes and even buy clothes for us from the store if they had been... My father, who passed away when I was uh, not two years old, yeah. But then my stepfather worked for the railroad, yeah. So um, we were able to, we had a better economic situation once we were with my father who worked for the railroad. But at the same time, because my mother came into the marriage with three children, she felt an obligation to help to support the family. And so... She continued to work the whole time. So they're kind of good to you as long as you stay in your place. Yes, and yes. And good within limits. That's right, okay. that's right. I mean, I'm sure that many people consider me very lucky. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes. And when I'd go to the belt store, even the white uh, uh, salespeople would refer to me as Little Miss Mabel rather than Mabel because they didn't want to res uh, disrespect the Belt family. And she would take me herself to the store to buy the things. And uh, I was privileged to have that connection with her that she was going to give me that stuff, but then I would get teased from the kids at school because of it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, little Miss Mabel, little Miss Mabel, you know. But anyway. <laughs> uh, so I have some mixed memories and mixed emotions about all of that connection. And I realize now that uh, we still were not looked at as deserving human beings, you know. Um, so then coming out of that environment and uh, marrying Rob and he's determined he's been off to the army and back and he has encountered all kinds of discrimination in the army and discrimination was everywhere and he was trying to get work and ran into all kinds of discrimination because of that he was intellectually uh, I would say he was an intellectual, intellectual superior to a whole lot of these people in Monroe. He wrote letters to the newspapers. Uh, he wrote poetry. Um, that age of your, uh, like fluid, kind of grasping kind of mind. Always yes, learn yes, and, and yes. He read constantly. He was constantly. We had a library of books and, and a lot of times when we had uh, very little money, a part of that money was spent for buying another book, you know, because he really had an inquiring mind and, and uh, 
trying hard to understand what was going on and I think Robert had a basic he had a basic belief that once people got to know each other and accepted each other on accepted each other's their our differences and and our our likenesses and understanding that we were all human beings he had a basic belief that people would come around and we could live in peace and harmony you know he even thought that the government was going to come in on our side from the time we I married him until the time that we returned from China I believe that he had a basic belief that there had to be good people in this government that were going to stand up for what was right because he always wanted to stand up for the right thing and he felt like other people were joining good people. And because Monroe did not join in, <laughs> they, just with they just not were, and they didn't believe like that. They didn't really believe that way. They didn't really believe that the government should be a government of for all the people. And I thought I don't know if they believe that now or not. That the government should be representative of all people and should look out for the best interests of all people. And that that is something that when I'm talking to young people today, I said if the Klan had known what a great education we would have gotten they would never have run us out of Monroe. <laughs> you know, the Klan uh, backing up the uh, Monroe officials and the FBI coming in, backing up the Klan and the Monroe officials. But it was, it was, it was a bad thing that turned into a good thing because getting out of Monroe and having dealings with people from all over the world, we were able to open up our minds and grow as individuals and grow to know, to really know that there is a, a fatherhood of God and a brotherhood of man. That's the only way I know how to put it. And if you really believe in that and you believe that you have to choose sides. There, there are forces out here that are forces for good, and there are forces out here for evil. And there comes a time in your life that you have to make a choice. And once you make that choice and you choose a side of good, then it just opens up a whole new world for you. You can be tolerant of people's prejudices because you understand that they are coming from you know where they're coming from that what those made that what made them that way but then you can appeal to their better side and hope and pray that they will choose as well to support the good forces in this world and become a part of this big family that we I feel we are those of us who have chosen the side of good are really a big family and we are a world family and there's no race racism in that family there are races in that family and there are people who prefer to be with their people and that's fine but there is a respect for each other and a respect for each other's beliefs and so anyway that's going way beyond where Monroe. Yeah. That's not what you found in That's not what I found in Monroe and I haven't seen that seed of good developing. It may be here and I hope to God one day I'll find it and look at those people and say here is the seed that is developing and growing in Monroe that is a part of the human family that realizes that we are all brothers and sisters in the final analysis and that we are all a little statue of Robert Neal <laughs>
probably in the museum. <laughs> oh. Center for, for tolerance or struggle. Right? Yes. <laughs> I haven't oh. seen a lot of signs. That, the Robert that, Williams Memorial. Yeah. yeah. Well, we. It doesn't have to be. It really doesn't have to be a Robert Williams Memorial. It doesn't have to be, but the the seeds that he planted in my mind, in my family's mind, in a lot of people, I think those seeds have to be nourished and hopefully. Uh, eventually there will be some young white Monroe Monroeans right. who will catch that seed, nurture that seed, and let it grow in Monroe. And then we can feel, uh, I can feel better about Monroe. I haven't seen that yet, and I, I really hope and pray that it will come in my lifetime. Yeah, I, I was going to get to this later. But, yeah. uh, and we can go back. Yes. But, but uh, that is something that, that interests me, is, 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 is how you, you think, looking back on everything that um, that, that you and, and Robert too would, would want his, his legacy to be y'all's legacy to be remembered that mm-hmm. what, uh, and not both in Monroe but beyond too yes that, beyond Monroe um, <coughs> that's the images of and y'all that are but people don't talk as much about kind of the meanings of yeah yeah of, of a life mm-hmm. what what did it all mean and and what was the struggle all about and and the fact that you know people li- like to blow up the fact that Robert was a violent man or That's believed right. in violence right. he makes a great poster Yes. Right, you know what I mean? Yes. Hey, yes. You know, I'm not against that. Right, right. And that was a part of what happened. It wasn't that he was he was not a nonviolent person. Well, no, he was a nonviolent person. He didn't believe in doing violence himself to others other than in defense of his own. And uh I think that his stance on violence, violent self-defense, let me put it that way. I think his stance on violent self-defense did more for the civil rights movement than people want to believe. Because once those evil people out there found that they couldn't do violence and be immune to violence, then they didn't do as much violence as they did when they knew they were doing it with immunity and that nobody was going to uh, prosecute them or they weren't going to have to pay any price if they killed. Uh, There used to be a uh, saying, kill a nigger, buy another one. You know, during slavery time, you kill a nigger, you buy another one. You know? And... um, but when they found out you kill a nigger, you're going to have to, maybe somebody, a nigger kill you. Bring it back to barn. That's right. So I think that that part of Rob's stance in saying just this far and no further played a big role in letting not only the racist um, bigots in the local area know that they had to make changes but let the power structure know that they had to really move to do some protection or else the country would suffer for it and fall apart so don't you think it also affected uh, the black community that, 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 that the example that Robert, mm-hmm. said that that also affected. Yes. Particularly, can you talk about that a little bit? That I think it, Here in Monroe, uh, all over. I think it. Both. 
Yeah, I think it affected the black community all over because at last it it made them see that well, no, we should we don't need to accept this just lying down and doing nothing. You know, we need to stand up, and when we stand up and 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 say no, uh, we make we have a greater impact. If we look at, this is a story that Robert liked to tell all the time. You go by a school, and it's a Martin Luther King school, and a little black child says to his mother, Mama, who was Martin Luther King? The mother replies, Martin Luther King was a civil rights man. He was a great leader of the black people. He loved his people, and he led them in a nonviolent fight, struggle. And uh, as a result of that, now we have integration and blah, blah, we. And he said, well, oh, what happened to Martin Luther King? Well, he was killed. And why was he killed? Well, he was killed because he loved his people, and he struggled for his people, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, go down the road, and here's a Medgar Evers University. Same scenario. Well, Mama, who was Megger Evers? And when she explains who Megger Evers was, well, what happened to him? Well, he was killed because he struggled for his people. He loved his people, and and uh, the racists killed him. They killed him. Malcolm X. Well, Mama, this is Malcolm X Boulevard. Who who is Malcolm X? Same story. He loved his people, he struggled for his people, and he was killed. And the message that that is given to young people, young black people is, if you love your people and you struggle to raise their level, you will be killed. So what young person is going to want to become a Malcolm X, a... um, Martin Luther King or Medgar Evers or any of those martyrs that now we got Martin Luther King holiday, you know. Who's going to want to pattern themselves after those people? Not anybody. No, and, and now you look out there, who's leading? Who's leading, you know? What kind of leadership do you have? Who wants to step in those footsteps? Nobody. But then you've got a Robert F. Williams who, as he liked to say, went home to Mount Vernon (laughs) and lived out his days as a gentleman. Well, like the the president went home to Mount Vernon and lived out his days as a gentleman. Um, Surrounded by his family. Yes, surrounded by his family and loved ones and so forth and so on. And had a long life, a long, fruitful life, loved his people, struggled for his people, fought for his people, not only nationally, not only in North Carolina, not only in Monroe, let's say, not only in North Carolina, not only in the United States, but all over the world, went all over the world and continued to struggle for his people and then went home to become a gentleman farmer, <laughs> you know. So, hey, maybe, maybe this is the kind, that's the kind of example that should be out there in front of not only black children, but white children as well. Hey, if you take the side of the people and you struggle for the best interest of the people and the side of good and, the side of good and hook your hook yourself to that star then your life is is worthwhile and that's the legacy that I would like to see for the Robert F. Williams story. That's the legacy that I'd like to see. And it goes way beyond, I mean you're right, it goes way beyond like the gun thing. Yes, yes yeah. way beyond that. Because it's a, it's a um, uh, that Guns do capture a young person's imagination. Yes, 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 yes. In a way that that, Mm -hmm. uh, having uh, a milkshake poured in your head at a lunch counter does not. Right, of course. But um, but it's something else. It's uh, um, 
don't you think like that when a you know when a child hears or uh, um, about Robert standing up for him mm-hmm, himself mm-hmm. that's why or any of the other people that you think of uh, uh, you know, the chamber mm-hmm. or Yes. But one sees something more mm-hmm. behind that. And what what do you think someone was gonna see? What what was behind behind the behind the shotgun? Uh huh. Um, what kind of, of uh, what were people seeing in Robert? I think they they would see a person who really knows that one person can make a difference. One person standing up can definitely make a difference in not only his life, but in the lives of other people. And that that one person, Rob believed that we all had that responsibility, that everybody's born for something, Everybody um, is here for a purpose. And that we, some people live their lives and they, they, they just eat and sleep and die and never do anything. Um, they don't have any causes. They don't have any, any purpose. And they think that there, there is no purpose. Maybe the purpose is just to get money, have a good time, Play. They say they don't have anything that they're willing to die for. Nothing that they're willing to die for. But you should have something you're willing to die for that gives you a reason to live. And I and and I think that that was the legacy, one of the legacies that he left. And um, I remember. Uh, one newspaper article during the time that Robert was had uh, said about self-defense, one newspaper article came out and said that he was advocating the indiscriminate slaughter of white babies in their crisp. Now, you know, that was, that was horrible. Making people think that this man, this is, here's a crazy man out here who is... Uh, uh, trying to get all the white folks killed. They were, that was just to mobilize white folks against right. him and against what was going on that was really a right thing in, in the society to, to be happening at the time. So. Where did he get that gun? I think it was passed down through his grandmother his grandfather and all the way down from slavery. His grandmother came out of slavery literate, knowing how to read and write, having been the offspring of a white slave master and a black slave. Uh, His grandfather came out of slavery knowing how to read and write and um, determined to teach their children that they were as good as anybody on this earth and that they should stand up for what was right and good. And I think that's another thing that the uh, white South has not, and white Monroe especially, has not lived up to. I remember I was talking to Robert's brother right before I came here. He still lives in Detroit, and he's 80 years old. And he remembers going into Secret's Drug Store and one, in Monroe, and one of the clerks coming up to his daddy, he was a little boy with his daddy, 
And the clerk came up to his dad and said, John, you know we're cousins. This white clerk said to Robert's father, John, you know we're cousins, but don't tell anybody. You know? And uh, so my 80-year-old brother-in-law remembers that to this day. But those family members, family members would never accept the fact that, like I said, we're all one family, even though we're black and white. They don't want to treat people like family, and they refuse to acknowledge the fact that they are family. <laughs> 